Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Charlotte, and I'm an alcoholic and an addict. Hi, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. In front of you this morning, my stomach is a little bit butterfly, and thank you, Betty, for those beautiful words. That made me very teary for some reason. Sort of a surprise. I want to thank the committee for asking me to be here and share with you this morning. Uh, the last time, I, w- I was just trying to remember the last time I was in this hotel, and it was just a couple of months after we were married, and I think it was the Georgia Prepaid Convention. And we came over for one night and then went right back home again. But I I can't help but comparing that time with this time. And the wonderful thing about it is at that time, I didn't think it could get any better. And I think that's what a lot of us feel when we come into Alcoholics Anonymous and we start feeling better and things in our life start going well and everything starts coming together and we get to a point where we don't think it can get any better. And for all of you who have been around for a few days or a few months or a few years, you all know, as I do, that it continues to get better. And I still have that tendency today to wonder how it can get better. But I know that if I keep doing the things that I've been told to do and I keep putting one foot in front of the other and walking the walk of recovery in this program, it's going to keep getting better for me. And I'm so grateful for that. Because I am a garden variety drunk, and I spent my whole life searching for some way to feel comfortable in my skin and never having the slightest idea how to do it. And I had to go to a bottom that for me was devastating, a bottom that for me that deprived me of any dignity, any sense of self-worth, any uh, any pride in myself as a woman, uh, a bottom that deprived me of any sense of uh, compassion and feeling for my uh, for other human beings, and any sense of communion with my God was robbed from me. I lost my soul. I went to the depths of hell, and I've come back. And I am grateful for that because, you know, somehow I know that it took that for me. And I don't know why. I don't know why some people are born and, and they're able to, you know, go through life and find a place where they belong and just keep going. And for me, it was necessary for me to go to those depths, and it's worth it. And I'm so glad to be here with you today. I was born in Boston, and I'm the eldest of six children. And for six years, my brother and I, well, it was just the two of us. My brother's a year and a half younger than I am. And I guess the remarkable thing about my childhood is how unremarkable un- unremarkable it was. Um, I was the oldest grandchild and had a large extended family and lots of aunts and uncles and grandparents and a lot of love. And I remember that feeling. And I remember the feeling of being special. And it's interesting how that changed over the years. Um, but at that time, I felt very special. What I didn't know about my home is that I was living in a home where alcohol was was present, and it was slowly deteriorating the fiber of my parents' marriage. But I didn't know that. It was early-stage alcoholism for my dad, and it was many, many years. In fact, I was an adult, and I was uh, grown and gone from home before I ever saw my dad drunk. So I didn't know what was going on there, but what I knew was that as I got older, things got worse, and I felt different. And I felt alone, and I felt isolated, and I felt ashamed to bring my friends home. And I didn't really know why. I just felt different. And by the time I was 11, I had begun experiencing those familiar feelings of rejection, of loneliness, of isolation, of feeling like I was on the other side of a big glass window and everybody else was over there. And you were all laughing and living and and being happy or being sad, but just living. And I didn't know how to live. I used to think if somebody would just tell me how to do this thing, I could do it. I could follow directions. But nobody ever told me. 
Maybe I wasn't able to hear at that time. But for whatever reason, I went through high school and terrified, and I don't know that I was that much different from any adolescent. But for me, it was. For me, it was every day was a torture to, you know, to get up and try to feel good about myself and try to do the things the other kids did and try to feel like I belonged. And it wasn't until I graduated from high school and I went out to dinner one night with some friends at a little Italian restaurant that I began to feel like I belonged. Because that was when I had my first drink. And my friends ordered me a whiskey sour because I didn't have any idea what to order. And I, re I remember this restaurant, you know, it was one of those, and I'm one of those drunks that remembers everything about my first drink. And this restaurant was one of those Italian restaurants in Boston that just is oozing with charm. And the little, you know, the little red checkered tablecloths on the tables and the Chianti bottles with the candles dripping down the sides and the piano player over in the corner and the tinkling piano. And I can, it just gives me goosebumps now. I just loved it. I fell in love with everything, all of the things that went with alcohol before I ever touched a drop. And then when I touched that drop, for those few minutes before I got sick, I loved it. And I felt like I was a part. I felt like I was a part of what was going on in the universe. And for the first time in my life, I really felt like I belonged. But then, after a very few minutes, I got very sick. And I remember this ladies' room. This is one of those ladies' rooms that you don't ever forget. And it was located at the top of a big flight of stairs, and it went up right in the middle of the restaurant. So to get there, you know, you everybody saw you doing this, going up to the restaurant, I mean to the restroom. And I got up there and... I got down on the floor, and I was hugging that commode, and I remember the little white checkered ceramic tiles on the floor, and the writing on the side of the commode, and I remember that feeling, how am I ever going to get up off this floor? And 30 minutes later, they came to get me, because I just, I couldn't. So they enlisted the aid of two gentlemen from the bar. And they came up, and there was one on each side of me, and they sort of dragged me down these stairs in the middle, all these eyes peering at me, and out the front door. And they took me to my friend's apartment, and we had to stop several times so I could be sick on the side of the road. But you know, the next morning I woke up, and I had my first hangover, and I felt awful, and I just wanted to die. And I remembered having to be carried out of that restaurant, and I remembered the humiliation and the embarrassment. And, you know, I was 17 years old, and I was wanting to be an adult, and, you know, I, this was my first chance at really doing something adult. And But what I remembered more than any of that, more than any of the negative feelings, was the feeling of belonging. And I knew that alcohol was going to be a part of my life. And for many years it was, for 20 years, in fact. And I began my drinking career. And, you know, it didn't really matter too much what I was doing or who I was with as long as there was alcohol involved. And I just loved it. I loved everything about drinking. It just was so, oh, it just made me feel great. And it made me feel glamorous and sophisticated and witty and charming and all of the things that I wanted to feel and I could never feel about myself. And after a few years, I moved to New York City, and I lived there for three years. And I ended up, when I was 24 years old, moving to Atlanta. And that was 1969, and I've been here, well, off and on. I've been in the South pretty much since then. I've had a few small excursions to Cleveland, Ohio, and to Houston, and I'll tell you a little bit more about Houston. But um, I, I consider myself pretty southernized by now, and when I go home... And my relatives hear me talk. They also consider me pretty southernized by now. But at any rate, I arrived in, in uh, Atlanta, and I was not, I didn't know the least thing about the South. In fact, I was w rubbing my head and wondering why I was doing this. But um, I came down with my company, and it was a promotion, you know, and it was an opportunity to sort of see the world and, or whatever, <laughs> you know. 
But I got down to Atlanta, and I wasn't quite ready for this. You know, I'd been in, living in Manhattan, and I was a real hot shot in Manhattan. And walking around, you know, down Fifth Avenue in my mini skirts and feeling like I had the world by the tail. And in 1969 in Atlanta, there wasn't a whole lot going on. I mean, compared to New York City. And I thought, golly, this is small town USA. Oh, how I was going to make it. And I was, I was pretty much assured of that. Pretty early on, there was a little girl that worked with me. And she was the cutest thing you have ever seen. And she was from Camilla, Georgia. And honey, we had a little language barrier. And I walked into the office one day, and I had broken a heel off my shoe. And I walked up to this girl, and and I said, Carol, do you know where I can find a cobbler? And she looked up at me with those big brown eyes. They were all sort of watery, and they looked at me, and she said, well, cobbler? Well, honey, the only cobbler I know is peach. (laughs) I said, oh, my Lord, what am I doing here? Well, I want to tell you that I fell in love. I fell in love with Atlanta. And I fell in love with the South, and they would have to pry me out with a crowbar now. But um, that was a difficult time. You know, I was, I was, of course, the way I, so of course, the way I found to console myself and to feel comfortable was I found a man who drank like I did. And we used to go to these bars, and we, you know, pass little romantic notes back and forth to each other, and, and, you know, meaningful little messages. And it was so romantic, and it was so wonderful, and we had so much in common, you know, we just had so much in common. So we got married, and that seemed, you know, like the logical thing to do. And the strange thing is, and I began noticing very early on, that we never had a whole lot to talk about in the morning. And he would try to get me to talk, and I never had very much to say. And I, and there was this little voice in the back of my head that said, you know, this isn't right. This isn't right. This isn't the way it's supposed to be. This isn't the way you're supposed to feel. You're newly married, and, you know, it's just supposed to be great, and it wasn't great. But when I got too frightened to listen to those voices in my head, I said, let's have a party, or let's go out to dinner, or let's do something, but always avoid. I I never had any idea how you dealt with problems, how you dealt with reality, how you dealt with living, just getting through life. I never knew. All I knew was escape and avoid and run away from anything that hurt. I thought that pain was something that you just got through and you waited till you got through the other side and you did everything that you could do to kill it until it stopped hurting. And what I didn't know was that you don't ever grow that way and you never learn anything about yourself. And then you end up going backwards. And that's what happened to me because you can't ever stay the same. And I started going backwards. And by the time I was in my early 30s, we were living in the suburbs of Atlanta and, you know, belonged to the country club and two cars in the garage and a dog. And I had my own little real estate company that was doing well. And um, I had a wide circle of women friends that were real important to me. And I played on the tennis team and, you know, did a lot of things that I thought were important and a lot of things to make me feel okay about Charlotte. And I I put a lot of effort into being the perfect career woman and the perfect wife and the perfect hostess and the perfect gourmet cook and, and all of these things, and my house had to be perfect. And, you know, I had to make a homemade meal every night and set the table with linen napkins and candles and clean the kitchen before I went to bed and do all of these things and then be a whiz bang at the office the next day and sell lots of property and make lots of money. And the more I did, the less I felt okay about Charlotte. And the more I ran around spinning my wheels, the more confused I was, and the more despondent I was, and the more I searched searched for relief. And this is the first time in my life that I can remember coming home from work and saying, I need a drink. So I was beginning relief drinking and searching for some sort of comfort within. 
Well, it was about this time. This this was the um, early 70s in Atlanta, and I guess it was probably the same just about everywhere. But there was a lot of um, talk and use of marijuana at that time. And it seemed like every party I went to, people were either smoking a joint or they were talking about it or they were talking about that they hadn't done it and they were going to. It seemed like a great time of um, experimentation. And, you know, it seemed so simple. It seemed so naive and it seemed so innocent. And everybody was doing it. And after a period of time, it decided that we needed to get initiated into the fine art of smoking grass. So we made these elaborate plans and, you know, got the wine and the candles and tacos. You know, you got to eat tacos when you... I don't know why. I don't... I never did. And you have to drink wine to part of the ambiance of smoking a joint, or at least that's what they told us. So we did this thing, and we passed that joint around the room, and it was awful. Oh, it was just... I got so sick again. You know, it seemed that, that every time I tried a new chemical, that's what happened to me. But, I, you know, one thing I found is that if I stick with something long enough and work at it hard enough, I can usually overcome it. And I just got real good at that thing. And it became a part of our daily routine. And so now, you know, it changed a little bit. We'd come home from work, and instead of having a, a scotch, you know, we'd have a glass of wine and a joint. And I began to get the munchies. And I began gaining a little weight, too. And began gain, gaining a lot of weight. Um, but, you know, it's interesting about, I guess, the most significant thing in my life about trying grass and about using grass is that it removed the obstacles to other drugs. And once I allowed myself permission to put something in my body to make me feel better, all of the obstacles to everything else were gone, too. And I began experimenting with other drugs. And whatever my friend, I did gems. If they gave it to me, I took it. And I tried amyl nitrate and quaaludes and PCP and speed. Um, I can't even remember it all now. You know, whatever was there, I did. None of it, none of it had for me uh, the allure of alcohol. Alcohol for me was a very private, a very personal drug. It was something that, and of course I didn't know it was a drug, nor did I think of it that way, uh, but it was something that I could enjoy by myself at home alone. I could, I could curl up in a corner with a book, and nothing gave me greater pleasure than a good book and a great, you know, a, a beautiful Waterford glass filled with Chevis Regal, and that was my idea of a big time. But... Uh, I did use other drugs, and and in my thinking began changing, and I began being aware of that. Um, my husband came home from work one night, and he had been out of work for a while. We were experiencing a recession in the real estate industry, and he had been out of work and job hunting and had been unable to find anything, and he came home one night, and he said, well, we're moving to Houston, and I'll never forget that as long as I live, and when I think of that what I remember about that feeling was the feeling of powerlessness and the feeling of not having a choice. I never knew I had any choices until I came to this program. I thought that, you know, you were, if you did certain things and if you were certain things, then, then you, you know, you had a little job description. And everybody had to live by that job description. And I don't know what happened to you if you didn't. Because I always did, and I figured out you know, what I was supposed to do as a wife and as a daughter and as a friend and as an employer and as an employee and, and all of these things. And I had a little job description for myself, and I worked hard filling all those job descriptions. You know, it's hard work being perfect. Have any of you ever experienced that? I mean, it's hard, and it's exhausting, and I would be worn out at the end of a day. But at any rate... Uh, I was angry. I was angry and I was, I was filled up with a sense of powerlessness and rage that I had to pick up my life 
and leave my company, my friends, my home, everything that I loved in Atlanta, and move to Houston, Texas. And who on earth would want to live in Texas anyway? It just seemed horrible to me. But the big significant thing that happened before we left is that at a going away party the night before going to Houston, I was introduced to cocaine. And that changed my life. Because I was addicted to cocaine in about three minutes. I had never felt anything like the feeling I had from cocaine. It made me feel powerful. It made me feel comfortable. It made me feel, for the first time, joyous to be exactly who I was. And at that, and for those few minutes of being high on cocaine, I wouldn't have traded places with anybody in the world. And I felt like I could do anything. I could have performed at the White House if you had told me. I'm not quite sure what I would have done, but I would have figured something out. And that's the feeling that I had, and I wanted more of it. We got out to Houston. I did all the things, you know, that you do when you move to a new town and unpacked the boxes and got settled in our new house and met neighbors and went job hunting and did all of that. But every time I met somebody new and every time I went to someplace different, I thought to myself, I wonder if they do it. I wonder if they know how to get it. I wonder if I should just, you know, I mean, how could I just sort of broach the subject without sort of revealing too much? That was six months. Hey, and they it. hey, sh- it was a sh- well, it was a short time before I started buying it for myself. And it wasn't very long after that that I started stealing to buy it. And I started lying, thinking more and more and more. And what I realized today is that from the very first drink, from that first night when I got sick, I had been a controlled drinker, always being careful, you know, how much I drank. Well, if I'm going to have an after-dinner drink, I won't have this drink. And, you know, if I'm going to have wine with dinner, well, I can, you know, juggling, trying to get get the perfect of that control was gone. And I would put out a line of cocaine or two lines of cocaine and pour a water glass full of scotch. And I was in love. I was t- with, the, with the drug, out, I, alcohol. Alcohol and cocaine. You know, when somebody asked, when I got to treatment, they said to me, what's your drug of choice, Charlotte? And um, I identified with al- being an alcoholic once I got to treatment. But what I realized after a short time is that I, my drug of choice is alcohol and cocaine. That is, that's it. That's the combination, the the perfect combination, and if I had to choose the best in the world when Conway was talking about his love for scotch, and and I feel the same way, but I'd say that the best combination in the world is champagne and cocaine, and honey, it doesn't get any better than that, Mm -hmm. and it almost killed me. I became the opposite of everything I ever wanted to be in my life. I lied, I cheated, I stole. My When I was a little girl, my hero was my grandmother. And my grandmother is one of these New England ladies that is, you know, it's interesting to ask my mother about her mother. This is my mother's mother. And her description of her mother is, you would, and my description of her mother, you wouldn't know that we were talking about the same person. And I guess that's what grandmothers are for. They can be that way for their grandchildren, because mine was for me. And she's one of these perfect ladies, and, you know, she drinks tea with her little finger like that, and she's a grandmother grandmother. She's loving and kind and wise and always, you know, and, and I always knew that with my grandmother she would always love me. And it didn't, regardless of what happened, that she would always love me. And I always wanted to be like her, and I thought, when I grow up, I'm going to be like my grandmother, and I'm going to be gentle and soft-spoken, and and I'm going to be, above all, a lady. And I wanted so much to be that way. And I realized, and I I can remember the morning that I realized it the most vividly, and I'd been up using all night long, and I got out of bed that morning, and I stumbled into the bathroom, 
And I looked at myself in the mirror. And I looked into my eyes. And of course, when I had gone to bed the night before, when I had gone to bed that morning, I hadn't washed my face. and I had mascara all caked on around my eyes. And I was all swollen and bloated. And, you know, my eyes were just pure red. And I looked horrible. And worst of all, when I looked inside of those red eyes, I didn't find anybody home. You know, there was, there was no clue as to who Charlotte was. And I looked at myself into that face that I despised and watched the tears rolling down my cheeks. And I said, I hate you. You know, when I got sober, one of the things somebody told me to do was to go to a mirror and look into my eyes and say, I love you. And that was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Because I had such total self-contempt and self-loathing for myself. And of course, you know, like everybody else that goes through this, I didn't know I was a sick person. I thought I was a bad person. I thought I was a moral leper, as our good friend Geraldine Delaney says. And I didn't think there was anything good about Charlotte at all to like. And it got worse. From that point where I didn't think I could get any worse, I did get worse. And it got worse. And everything around me got worse. And when I, one of the, the greatest lights of my life when I moved to Houston was finding a job that I adored. And what I realize now is that I became addicted to that job just as I became addicted to cocaine. And I go to work in the morning and it was a little golf company and they, um, a golf association and they sponsor and promote golf tournaments. And no matter what I did the night before and how much cocaine and alcohol I had used, I had to go to work that day because that was my daytime drug until the very end, until I started having to drink around the clock and use other drugs, Valium, Librium, whatever. But I loved this job. And the day that my life fell apart, that I really knew it was falling apart, it was the day before the big professional tournament starts in Houston. And working in the field, of course, I knew everybody. And we were there outside the the um, clubhouse, you know, where the tournament was going to take place. And there were just thousands of people. All the golfers had come to town and the network television people and the PGA Tour officials and all in the golf groupies, you know, and just thousands of people all over the place. And it was late afternoon that previous day and the sun was setting over the golf course and it was gorgeous. And I was confronted with who I was and what I was. And the person confronting me was my husband. And God knows that he knew. And he didn't even know at all. But I shudder to think of what he did know. And he stood there, and I looked at him, and there was a security policeman on each side of him, and they were holding him back. And I could see him as he was straining against them, and he was trying to get to me. And I don't know what he would have done if he could have gotten to me, but I know what he wanted to do. And it wasn't pleasant. And as I looked over at him, and listened to the words that he was screaming. I looked around me, and everywhere I looked, there were people staring at me, little groups of them standing around. And I remember there was a catwalk overhead, and I looked up, and there were people leaning over the railing and looking down at me. And it was like they were boring a hole into my soul. You know, it was... For the first time, I had to say that people knew who Charlotte was. They knew who I was and what I was, and I felt like I had a scarlet letter emblazoned on my forehead. And I wanted to die, and if the ground had just opened up and swallowed me up, I'd have been so grateful. And there was nowhere to hide. And it got worse. And you know... In those last days, and I can remember this so vividly, and being so filled up with despair and wanting to die, and I know now that I would easily have taken my life if there had been some easy way of doing it, some painless way of doing it, 
but I was too afraid of that. I was afraid of the pain, and I was too afraid to live. And I didn't know what to do. But, you know, even in those last days when I could, when I wondered how I was going to get through the day, I thought to myself, if I can just look okay, if I can look pulled together, I'm going to convince them that it was all a terrible mistake, that it was all him, that there's something wrong with him, that there's nothing wrong with me. Even then, I thought that the outward appearances were going to fix me inside. I just didn't know. And he came to me not too long after that, and he said, Charlotte, I'm going back to to Atlanta, and if you want to go, that's fine, and if you don't, that's fine, too. I don't care. Well, I wanted to go back to Atlanta. Well, first of all, you know, I had it all figured out that Houston was my problem, and that once I got out of there, that awful city, I was going to be okay. And we got back to Atlanta, and it was July 3rd, 1981, and the next day, the sun rose on Independence Day. And in a way, it was the beginning of my independence because for the first time I realized that what was wrong with me, that whatever it was, and I still didn't have a clue what it was, but whatever it was was inside of Charlotte. And we had spent the day at a lake north of Atlanta, and it was the same lake where I had had cocaine for the first time three years before that. And we spent the day up there with surrounded by friends that I had missed and loved and, and, you know, wanted to see for those years. And we had boats and jet skis and water skis and spent the day on the water and ate and drank and had marijuana. And we just, oh, it was just wonderful. Lots of music. And it was one of those wonderful, magical days. But for me, there was nothing magical about it. Because when the day ended... And I sat on the living room floor of my best friend's house. And I looked at my feet and listened to the sounds that I had so longed to hear. The sounds of my friend's voices, laughter, the tinkling of the ice cubes, and the water lapping against the shore. And at that moment, I knew. I knew that whatever it is was right here. And when I, as I, as I realized that, I was filled with the most incredible terror. And I got up off the floor, and I ran out the front door of the house, and I ran down this dirt road and off into the woods. And I was screaming, screaming. And I ran through the woods, and I finally fell down. And I was lying there on the ground, pounding the ground and screaming and sobbing. And they came to get me. And they put me to bed, and for the next three months, I never drew a sober breath. I started with alcohol, and I ended with alcohol. And it was alcohol, ultimately, that almost killed me. I became very sick physically. I got the flu and bronchitis, um, eventually pneumonia. I was, uh, I was deathly ill. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't even drink anymore. Um... I would try to take a, a couple of sips of wine, and I would have to go right to the bathroom, and I was throwing up blood, and it was, you know, I was devastated, and I knew I was dying, and I didn't have any idea what was wrong. Finally, I went to my family physician, and when I walked into his office, my face was bloated out to here, and I had black and blues up and down both my legs. My skin was yellow, and my liver was distended, but I didn't know that either. And this wonderful man knew addiction when he saw it. And he took my hands in his hands, and I'll never forget as long as I live, the love in his eyes as he looked at me and he said, Charlotte, you're an alcoholic. And you know, as I remember the way I felt that at that moment when he said those words to me, there was a big part of me that was screaming on the inside and saying, it can't be. No way. I can't. I mean, people, people, this doesn't happen to people like me. And yet there was another part of me that was saying, thank God, because he said there's something that we can do about it. You can learn to live without it, Charlotte. You can learn to live one day at a time. And you don't have to do this anymore. And he put me in treatment that day. And it was there that I was given my life back. 
And in a, a broader sense, it was there that I was given my life for the first time because finally somebody told me how to do it. Finally, somebody said, Sharp, wanting the key to living, and we're going to give it to you. And they showed me those 12 steps. And it didn't mean a whole lot to me. And I, I must tell you that I looked at those 12 things and I thought, what? During those weeks in that treatment center, center were the, the beginning of the realization that I was sick and I wasn't bad. And for me, that was so important. Because as a woman who had betrayed everything, everything that was important to me, I felt that I would never again be able to walk down a street and hold my head up and not be ashamed and, and have my eyes down. And that was a beginning, a beginning of acceptance of my disease. And my counselor, my, my primary counselor, used to say we had a little women's group uh, within the treatment center. And we would, you know, during the women's group, we would talk about much more intimate things, obviously, than we did in mixed groups. And I would share something that was particularly devastating and humiliating for me. And that counselor would look at me, and she was wonderful. And she'd say, Charlotte, that's kid stuff. Let me tell you something. And she would tell me a story from her addiction. And I'll tell you, it made my hair stand on end. And it was what I needed to hear. I needed to, I needed somebody who had been farther down than I had. And she had done something. There was something else that she said to me. And because she gave so much of herself, I could believe her. And I listened to every word she said. And the other thing that she said to me that I listened to and I believed was that I had to start believing in something. And she said, you know, Charlotte, you're going to hear a lot of people say in AA that there are no musts that we make suggestions, but I'm going to give you a must. And I'm going to tell you right here and now that if you don't find something greater than yourself to believe in, you're not going to make it. Well, I wanted to make it. I was hurting so bad. I'd have done anything to feel better. And I got out of that treatment center. And I had begun the process while I was there of finding a God that I could relate to, a God that was going to love me and accept me. And I was raised a Catholic, and, you know, there was a big part of my Catholicism that I loved, and bigger part, that filled me up with guilt and shame. And, you know, I had this image of my God way out there, and he had long white hair and, you know, the robes, and he, he sat out there on his cloud, and he pointed his finger at me, and it didn't matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. And I, I began to realize that I needed a God that wasn't going to be a judging, condemning God, a God that was going to be a loving God, and that was going to always be there for me. And I began that problem, that God, and I used to think of him as sitting on my shoulder. And I, you know, I, I'd think that, and I started feeling better, and I would think, gosh, I've got to remember. And I couldn't remember it. I, I just, it was the last thing I would think of. I'd, I'd get out there and I'm all involved in what was going on in my life and I would, all oh, I would forget all about God. And I thought, well, I'm just going to think about him right on my shoulder. And he just, he just sat on my shoulder and somehow that was an easier image for me to, re, for me to identify with. And I thought about my God sitting there on my shoulder loving me. And he talked to me, and we would have these little conversations that I was okay and that he loved me. And I began spending time on my knees, and I began spending time learning about meditation. And I began getting down on my knees and going to my little secret garden and listening to my God. And he would say to me, Charlotte, you're the daughter of a king. You can have it all. There's nothing you can't do because I'm with you. And if you ask me, I'll work in your life. And for the first time in my life, I understood what they said. meant when they said, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will open. And someone said to me, you know, Charlotte, it's a lot like electricity. Electricity is this fabulous a force that we have in our lives have any light 
We're not going to have any heat. And God's kind of like that, and that made sense to me. You know, he's always there for us. But if we don't turn that switch on and ask him to work in our lives, it's not going to do any good. Well, you know, I, one of the things that I like to say is that um, I did everything that they said to do, and I just realized that that's not true. That's not true at all. In fact, I had to confess that to my home group the other day I was talking. And I said, you know, I, I've, been, I've been telling everybody I did everything they said to do. I didn't do everything they said to do at all because they told me not to make any major, major changes for a year. And um, I did. And when I was 90 days sober, I became a single woman. And uh, I'm not recommending that as the way to do it. But for me, it was necessary. For me... Uh, It was the first time I knew absolutely for certain that I was doing what I was supposed to do. And I had prayed about it, and I had asked for direction about it, and the answer came to me as clear as a bell that this was what I was supposed to do. So at 90 days sober, I set out on my own, and I didn't have any money, and I had a job that was straight commission, and I had no family around, And um, I was scared. I was really scared. But you know, for the first time in my life, I had something I never had before. And I had Charlotte. And there was something within me that said, it's going to be okay. You're going to make it. You're going to be okay. And that sustained me through many, many tough times. And there were months when I didn't have any idea where the rent was going to come from. And just at the last minute, I'd sell something. It would just, I mean, God gave me money when I needed money. I said, God, I need money. I need to pay my rent. And I can remember this one time I had an insurance payment due on my car, and I had to come up with $100, and I had seven cents in my wallet. And my parents were living in North Carolina at the time, and I was going up to spend the weekend with them. And I knew that if I had asked my dad for $100, he'd have given me $100. But there was I just didn't want to do that. And I struggled with it all weekend. Oh, should I ask him? No, I'm not going to ask him. Oh, go ahead. No, don't do it. You know, the little voices, the committee in my head. And I finally decided, no, I'm not going to ask him. And I left that Sunday afternoon, and I was on my way back from North Carolina to Georgia, and it had been raining. And I was driving along, you know, and all of a sudden it started to clear up a little bit. And the sun started to peek through the clouds. And, oh, as the sun came through and it hit all that wet rain on, still on the hood of the car, it got real bright. And I, I got out my sunglasses and I lowered the visor. And as I lowered the visor, this little white envelope sort of floated down to the seat behind, beside me. And I reached down, and I picked up the envelope, and I opened it up, and out of it came a $100 bill with a little note that said, I love you, Dad. Well, you know, my father might have thought that that was his idea to give me that $100, but I know better. And that's the way it was for me. And that spring came in Atlanta, and it was the most fabulous spring, the spring of 1982. It was the most fabulous spring that has ever been, I know. And the sky was bluer, and the birds were sang sweeter, and the flowers were more colorful and beautiful than they'd ever been. I was beginning to live, and my heart was singing. Finally, my heart began to sing. And I began to feel like I was alive in a way that I never had before. And that May, for Memorial Day, my parents sent me money to go down to Women in Recovery. It was an early birthday present. And I went down to Women in Recovery, and I thought, oh, gosh, this is, but it got great. I met women that I had never met from all over the state. And we shared, and I learned, and I found out more about Charlotte, and I was, I was getting ready to pack up and go home with just an armful of all kinds of new information and love and warmth and all sorts of warm fuzzies, and I didn't think it could be any better. But Sunday morning, I walked in for the spiritual speaker, 
And as I walked into that room and you heard last night, I found myself looking into the most gorgeous blue eyes I'd ever seen in my whole life. And that's where I met Conway. And as he told you, we sort of lost each other. You know, and, and I got back home and I knew I, I knew he was going to call. I mean, you know, women just know these things. And I just knew he was going to call. And um, I told my girlfriend that, and I said, he's going to call. He's, I just, oh, you're going to go out with him? I said, of course I'm going to go out with him. So I waited and waited and waited, and he didn't call, and he didn't call, and he didn't call, and I couldn't figure it out. I knew I had been right. And then I walked into the Atlanta Roundup the end of July and found out that he didn't know my name or my number. You know, the, the strange thing is women are much smarter than men, you know, and I don't know if you all know that. But it's true, because when I had gone over to his house that afternoon, I signed the guest book. And usually, I mean, a lot of times my handwriting isn't too legible, but I printed it. And I wrote real slowly, and I, I made sure that, you know, he was going to be able to read it so he would know exactly how to get in touch with me. But he never looked at his guest book. Anyway, it was, um, it was wonderful. We... I guess I knew for sure that this was the man I had waited for. I, I didn't wait very well, did I? Anyway, this was the man that I had dreamed of all my life. And it was on our second date, and Conway had been out of town, and he had come back into town and was picking me up, and we went to this Chinese restaurant around the corner. And something had happened, I, I'm not even sure what it was, but something had happened that I was real excited to share with him. And that was the, the thing that I felt about Conway the very first time we were together, was that I could tell him anything, and he just was, I mean, he just knew, he understood me. We related, our hearts talked from that first moment, they just communicated. And so I couldn't wait to share this thing with him, that it, you know, that was, so exciting in my life, and we sat down and we ordered, and I just blurted it out and told him the story, and I can remember him sitting there and just so lovingly looking at me, and he said to me, you know, Charlotte, you remember when you were a little kid, and you know, you might have found a flower or a frog or something, and it was just wonderful, and it was full of wonder, and but then you took it to your best friend, and you showed it to them, and you shared it with them. And it made it so much more special. And I was sitting there going. And he said, I feel like you've just given me your frog. Well, that was it for me. Sayonara. The fireworks were going off and the violins were playing in this little Chinese restaurant all in my head. And I knew that I was a goner. And two months later, we were married. And we did that in a real sober, mature fashion also. First of all, I have to tell you that we were married one week after my first AA birthday. So we were legitimate. And I didn't want anyone worrying about that. We were legitimate. Um, but then, the other thing is, we got this thing all figured out now. Conway has five children. I don't have any children, but I have this big family, you know. And we knew that we were right for each other from the first moment. But our families didn't have the advantage of, you know, crawling inside of, of us and knowing how we were feeling. And we knew they were going to be concerned about this whirlwind courtship. So we thought, well, we, we need to wait a little while. We need to give them a chance to get adjusted to the idea and, you know, all of that. And so we decided we'd get married on April 22nd and give everyone a chance. Well, then we got thinking about it. And you heard what he said about thinking. Most dangerous thing an alcoholic can do? Well, the more we thought about it, the more we thought, well, we just don't want to wait till April. And we didn't want to be separated for one minute. And there was something um, about, we just didn't want to live together either. You know, it was, I mean, it wasn't a moral decision. It was just that we had waited so long, we wanted to be married. And also, I needed to get a passport. And it seems silly to get two passports. You know, why get a passport? And then you've got to go back and change the name and all that. So we decided that what we'd do, now I want you to pay attention to this, what we'd do 
was we would get married and we wouldn't tell anybody and we'd pretend that we were living together. And so that's what we did. Well, we did that for about a week. And um, we finally confessed to our sponsors what we had done. We couldn't keep it a simple thing that had happened and we were trying to keep it a secret. We were walking around like this, trying not to smile. <laughs> and... Um, so our sponsors helped us remember that this was an honest program. I guess that little part just sort of slipped by. And so we told everybody, and it's amazing how well they took it. Um, everyone was a lot more understanding than we would have thought. These last, let's see, we'll be married uh, seven years in September. And... You know, if anybody had told me what these seven years, what these eight, almost eight years, seven and a half years of my sobriety have brought into my life, I'd have never believed it. Uh, I'd have said, you know, that's not possible for me. I have climbed mountains, and I don't mean literally, but I mean emotionally and spiritually. Uh, things within myself that I never thought were possible. I've done things, you know, I, I've learned that I can forgive. I've learned that I can love the unlovable. I've learned that I can accept myself and that I can love myself, and that's something that I never thought I could do. There have been, Alcoholics Anonymous has shown me how to do what I thought was impossible. And what I know that it, as long as I walk the walk and I do what they told me to do right at the beginning, I'm going to continue to be able to do that. Wait, we are mountaintop people. There's nothing that we can't have that we can't accomplish if we're willing to walk the walk. You know, there are people out there on these streets of Albany today that are dying. There are people out there that are having the same kinds of living problems that we have. Because all of us have living problems. Everyone in this room has some living problems. But those people out there on that street don't have a way to deal with it, and we do. We have, we have a prescription for living. And it doesn't matter what, what we're confronted with. It doesn't matter what sort of turmoil or what difficulties or what opportunities. We can overcome them. We can overcome them. We can be triumphant. And we can live a life of joy and freedom far beyond the mortal man. I was watching, uh, and I, I imagine many of you did, the Bill Wilson special not too long ago, and I was reminded once again of the wonder and the miracles that have been given to us these last 50-some-odd years. You know, people like us, they locked up, and we died. We died just a little more than 50 years ago. And today we have a chance to be the top to be the top of the heap. We are the best. We're the finest. I believe that we're God's chosen people. We have work to do. And you know, each one of us is unique and different. And we each have a very special thing to do. And sometimes that's really hard for me to believe. And I know it down deep. And yet, you know, there's another part of me that says, oh, fiddle do But it's true. There's something very special that I have to do in this life. There's something very special that you have to do in this life. And if each of us doesn't do that thing, it's never, ever going to get done. The history of mankind is going to pass by, and that one thing that each of us was supposed to do isn't going to get done. And that's what I try to remember when I'm faced with something that scares me. When I'm faced with, with, with an everyday problem that I think is insurmountable, or too difficult for me to handle, or too big, or too much, that if I don't do this thing, it's never going to get done. And then how great I feel afterwards. And that's the whole secret to living. You know, that thing that I wanted to know about when I was 12 years old, and that I asked, if only buddy, somebody would show me how to live, if only somebody would show me how to deal with pain, how to deal with problems, I could do it. And somebody has shown me that today, and I am eternally grateful for that. You've given me everything I've ever dreamed of. You have fulfilled my dreams, 
and you've given me hope untold for tomorrow. And for that, how can I ever say thank you? Other than to tell you that I love you and I appreciate you. God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.